Welcome to Roll for Crit Spotlight. I'm Jonathan Estes. And I'm Will Keeler. And Spotlight, if you don't know, is the series in which we invite members of the tabletop gaming world to talk about their experiences and the industry itself. Our guest today is a designer, developer, and marketer for North Star Games, where he's worked on titles such as Happy Salmon, Evolution, and the upcoming Oceans. He's also the co-founder of Move38, a developer of unique and innovative games and other creative tools. In addition to a number of abstract designs he's developed independently, Nick Bentley, welcome Welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, very exciting. We're practically old friends at this point, I think. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I made you godfather to my children, by the way. I didn't <laughs> oh, tell boy. you that yet. Oh, that, that was a bad move. <laughs> <laughs> May have been a mistake. We'll see. Uh, as we're recording this, it's a week out from Gen Con. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I imagine you are probably busy, frantic, preparing for that, as are we. Yes, yeah, my brain might be a little scrambled for this interview since I have 80 different things coming out of my ears. <laughs> I'm sure, so uh, we'll cut you some slack in that area. Uh, well, I'm not sure, we'll see when this goes up, if uh, it's before or after or during Gen Con, people will uh, <laughs> it will get to hear about it. Uh, but to start off, so as I mentioned at the top, you've worked on several iterations and expansions for the Evolutions games. It seems like kind of a big cornerstone in your gaming career. Could you give us a condensed version of your history, or as long as you want, with the Evolutions series of games, and also talk a little bit about Oceans, which is coming up very soon? Yeah, so I uh, came to North Star in 2014, right, as the first Evolution game was rolling out. And I immediately uh, kind of got glommed onto it uh, because I'm a former scientist. I used to be a neuroscientist in a previous life. Uh, I have a PhD in something called computational neuroscience. And uh, biology has always been a major part of my life. So I was really excited to see that somebody w- was trying to make a game Uh, that reflected some realities of evolution and that somebody was the company I was going to work for. So uh, ever since then, I've been really into helping the company sort of nurture that brand of games, help design them, help market them, et cetera. Yeah, Yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of become, it seems like your baby in a way. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's not as much my baby as it is Dominic Krapuchet. Sure, sure. Dominic is Mm -hmm. co-founder of the company and he's the one who originally had the idea to do an evolution game. Um, So it all starts with him. But uh, if anybody could challenge him for the... uh, for the prize of be having it be a baby of theirs, that's a weird thing to say. It's me. (laughs) You're the godfather. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, and so... That has led to uh, me uh, designing or co-designing the next game in the Evolution series, which is called Oceans. Uh, I'm co-designing it with a uh, a marine biologist named Brian O'Neill, and we've been working on it for now nearly two years. These games have very long, heavy development cycles. Um, Right. Animals don't evolve in uh, overnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I can talk a little bit about why about why that is. But that's been great fun. Uh, our part on the game is is mostly done now. Now uh, North Star is developing it in-house. And that's mostly uh, what Dominic is doing. He's doing the development on it since his head is so deeply into the, uh, the machine of it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it... Has it been much longer compared to other games that you've designed? Is it the uh, longest lifespan for development that you've experienced? Oh, no. I mean, I think a lot of our games go through cycles like this. We have a very sort of perfectionist view of game development. So, you know, there are different models for running publishing companies. Uh, There's a spectrum, but, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you might have just publish a whole bunch of things and wait for something to stick. And at the other end, you have a very curated view where you're really carefully about what you decide to publish. And when you do decide to publish something, you develop it uh, till kingdom come before releasing it. We're more that than the throw everything at the wall and see what sticks model. So a lot of our games go through um, development periods that are really long. I mean, even Happy Salmon, which came to us basically complete, you know, we worked on that for six or seven months, something like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's dedication. And I think it shows in the final results. Yeah. 
Evolution was also one of those, really the first games I could think of that you uh, introduce a Target exclusive version. I was curious, uh, what are your thoughts on that version and the idea of these store exclusives, particularly with Target, which seems to be getting a lot of them in general? Yeah, so that is explicitly Target's strategy for competing against online people, and by that I mean Amazon. Um, it, it's very hard for uh, for online and offline retailers to compete for the same products. The online people are going to win because their cost structures are better. So uh, a savvy offline strategy is to pu- publish things that only they have. Uh, and so that's what's tar- what Target is doing. Um, and it, it's working really well for them. It's worked really well for us, for uh, Evolution, the beginning. And it allows us to design knowing exactly the audience that we're going to hit. Uh, we know ex- it's much easier to, to make a game that someone likes if you know who that someone is. Um, and, you know, Target has a lot of information about who it is that, that's buying games off the shelves of Target. Um, yeah, so it's great. Uh, I really like it. And we have, uh, I, sh- I would be rem- remiss not to mention that we actually are doing much more of that with them this year. Starting in just a few days, we're releasing uh, three more Target exclusives with them. Wow. Uh, so that's one of the things that I'm scrambling to get done, all the launch marketing, before I head to Gen Con. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that you're taking the time out to talk to us in the midst of all that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so you also mentioned that you're a former neuroscientist and a biologist, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did my undergrad in biochemistry, got a master's degree in neurobiology, and then a PhD in computational neuroscience. So that, at the very least, makes you the smartest person on the show right now, (laughs) Uh, if not who's ever been on this show before. It sounds good at cocktail parties, but it doesn't, you don't have to be smart to get through that gauntlet of education. I, I, <laughs> yeah. wish, I wish I did, but it's, you really don't have to. There's a lot of theater involved. I, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Considering I made it through with the Bachelor's of Arts in Neuroscience, I guess that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I feel like a lot of your games have design philosophies that I might call cerebral in some ways. Do you feel that your background in those fields did contribute at all to the way that you design games? I know at least the biology aspect, of course, relates to evolution, but maybe even more so in the actual mechanics themselves. Yeah, and I mean, I actually think that's a bit of a liability for me as a game designer and developer because uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd call them intellectual, but I'm really into high commitment games, which aren't necessarily best selling games. So, I mean, I've been designing games for, you know, almost 20 years now. Um, But for most of that time, I was designing games that couldn't be published and that I knew couldn't be published because they were too commitment heavy. So I would design like two player abstract games with no luck, kind of like, you know, the game Go, the ancient Chinese game Go. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I, me personally, as a games player, I love games where I know that I can play 4000 times and still love it um, and study it because my favorite thing about gaming is the learning. Uh, but that's not everybody's favorite thing about gaming. And in fact, most people who buy games are probably more about the social aspect of games playing. And so um, I've, as I've become a professional, reoriented the way that I think about and develop games towards that sensibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel like evolution is definitely a good marriage of those two philosophies. Yeah, the, I mean, there's still a lot of intellectualism in it. And it's not just me. I mean, you know, the, Dominic set the tone for the series, but he's also a very, like, intense intellectual guy. So um, there's a lot of kismet there between uh, me and my boss. But, of course, he can also get you in trouble if you make things that are too obscure or require too much thinking. (laughs) Thinking is hard. Yeah. And not only that, when you – according to – I've seen multiple places, you've said that your design principle is that – Except in special cases, I like to design games that aren't like others rather than improve on pre-existing concepts. Yeah. How do you tackle that, especially like in the board game market now where there seems to be so many new games, many of them innovative, some of them, I mean, just maybe repeats, but come out 
faster and faster each time. And also, does this mean we won't get an evolution legacy? Um, <laughs> I cannot <laughs> promise that we won't get an evolution legacy. <laughs> I mean, that, that's actually a very real possibility. So for my company, I don't necessarily decide what games we're going to publish. I mean, I have an, a say, obviously. Um, so like, I, I want to draw a distinction between like the game design projects that I choose to initiate on my own versus the projects that I work on for North Star. Uh, so w when I'm designing just for myself, I tr I imagine myself setting off into a direction in an abstract space, the space of game designs, and I try to end up in a location that no one has been to before, and not even near a place that no one has been been to before. Right? I very like I like to think about game design as adventuring through design space, um, and that's very exciting to me. Now, when you're designing, or when I'm, you know, helping North Star Games publish games. Uh, there is not as much of that. We want to make game. So to make a great game that people latch on to right away, having references is, is important and having it feel intuitive right away is important. And one way, maybe the way that you do that is having it be not too different from other things that have come before. Of course, you want it to be somewhat different, um, but not too different. So like a great example, you mentioned legacy systems, uh, a, you know, the first really big legacy game was actually Risk, which is a game that many people are familiar with. So the legacy concept was completely new, but it was wrapped around this older idea so that people had a way in. Uh, and that's sort of how I think about how novelty should be approached when producing games as commercial products. Right. I know one of the big ones that we see a lot is deck building where, you know, there's a million deck building games, but when someone takes that and uses it and does something unique with it, really freshens things up. Yeah. Maybe more practical sometimes than uh, for just from the ground up having to come up with a, you know, you're always going to be drawing cards and taking actions as opposed to having to come up with some insane new thing that's never been done before. Right. I do think like, deck building is an interesting example. I do think that right now there are way too many designers making too many games just because they can. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with making games for fun, but if you're going to make a product, I feel like in a world where 4,000 games are published every year, uh, your justification for putting all the work into publishing should probably be more than just, oh, this is interesting. It should be, uh, this is different in an important and very compelling way. I say this because I'm all, I also do a lot of game evaluation for from game designers who've submitted games to our company. And I've noticed that many of them don't, they can't articulate what, what will make their game stand out in a world where 4,000 games are published every year. And I wish more did. So if any of you out there are game designers thinking of submitting game designs to North Star Games, that is my number one question for uh, any game submission. Good to know for uh, all those game designers and probably anyone going on Kickstarter because just as uh, when we do our Kickstarter videos, sometimes you're just like, uh, I mean, this looks like great, but we've seen it like thousands of times. Right, right. So we just talked about one of your design principles that you posted. There's another one where you mentioned that you're not into point salads or games where you're just trying to get a bunch of points all over the place in order to win. Rather, you want to design games with a clear end goal. Yeah. How do you go about creating those goals in your designs? Do you start with the goal and work backwards? Or is it something that you find works itself out naturally once you've come up with sort of the game flow? So, yeah, I mean, the best way to do it is to start with it if you're making that um, well, I, no, I should retract that. It's not necessarily the best way, but it is definitely the easiest way to get there. If you can sit down, come up with a rule that's very visual, you can just imagine it happening. I mean, chess is sort of the greatest example. Like, you can picture in your head visually exactly what happens to get you the win. Um, whereas there's not a visual that goes with uh, point salad approaches. It's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. There's nothing like unifying about it. Um, and I, I don't love that. 
Um, but there's also another way, which is maybe a bit harder, but I think kind of magical when it happens, which is that you sort of have a mechanism first, and then you let the mechanism suggest uh, sort of natural end conditions that would fit with that mechanism. Uh, if you get the right mechanism, then you can often come up with uh, you know, a great and very natural feeling end condition, which is also visual and concrete. And that's uh, that's magic when it happens. Yeah, I definitely prefer that always in games. You know, every time we're learning a new game and it's how do you win? Get a bunch of points. OK, right. But there's something about being able to latch on to. I'm trying to do something and that's it. I can feel that more naturally. Yeah, it takes away from the theme for me to have to think about. Point salads like if I'm. If I'm playing a dinosaur killer game, I want to win by killing the dinosaur, you know? <laughs> right. Not by uh, accruing points based on my relationship with the dinosaur. <laughs> For sure. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up theme because that's something I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, a lot of the designs of games that you have on your personal site, as you mentioned, are Go-inspired, more abstract designs with limited themes. Whereas, for example, something like Oceans, of course, uh, is a little bit more thematic. What is your approach to theme in games? Is it something that you really enjoy? Or are you really more interested in the mechanics and the theme is just sort of a layer on top? Uh, I would say I I like both ways. And I like them when I go whole hog one way or the other, right? So, uh, like... If there's going to be a theme involved, I want to start with the theme and end with the theme. And I want every single mechanic to be, you know, chosen through the lens of how do I make this uh, as thematically rich as possible, um, which doesn't necessarily mean having a lot of rules. It means having just the right rules to create a dynamic that feels like the real life situation, or at least how you imagine the situation would play out. Um, what I, I think what I don't like is when um, you have a game which is kind of like pays lip service to theme, but doesn't really do it. You know, like game designers will design a game from a mechanic's first point of view, but then they know they have, in order to publish it, they need to give it a theme. So they put a theme on, but then it doesn't fit that well. And I don't really like that. I, I, if I'm going to do theme, let's just do it. Let's go all the way. Uh, or if we're going to uh, glory in the mechanics of something, let's go all the way doing that. Yeah, that, that sounds like probably most uh, like third-party projects or anything coming out for a movie, <laughs> a game based on a movie. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I know uh, we tend to lean towards the more thematic games, the two of us. Uh, but of course, if you, if you just have that, if you don't have something underlying to support it, it just falls apart. Right, yeah. I mean, and I, so that also means because thematic games, uh, there's such a larger market for thematic games than for non-thematic games that for practical purposes in my day job, working on games, they always are thematic, right? Um, at least right. when I'm working on hobbyist games or strategy games, when I'm working on mass market games, it, it can be a little bit different. So, um, like a, a party game, like happy salmon, that is a pure mechanism, right? Um, that is meant to create a certain vibe at a party, uh, not to evoke a theme. And so the constraints on that kind of game are different. Right. And I'm sure you always have to deal with too, like you said, like it's easier with thematic sometimes, even just for the cover, like the one of the thousand Cthulhu games, people are like, oh, that's Lovecraft. When if you have just hexagons or something, <laughs> right, you have to explain the game. Yeah. So like in, when I design an abstract game, I'm often designing sort of like deep dynamics into the game that you won't even see the first 20 times you play it and who's going to even get that far. So I think of those almost more as art pieces, sort of things to satisfy my own sense of wonder rather than things that I necessarily have to have other people play. That's nice. I like that. There's something beautiful about that, I think. Yeah, no, there is. There is. You have to do things for you, you know, and that's, yeah. It's pure. It's simple and pure. And speaking of uh, you know, unique art pieces, 
you know, er, earlier in our description, we talked about how you co-founded uh, Move 38. So we were curious, what's the inspiration behind it? Yeah. And also, do you think it's going to, how's it going to interact with the board game industry in general? Do you think it fills a small niche or do you think it could be something as big as like legacy in terms of shaking things up? Oh, right. That's a really, those are really interesting questions. So, okay. First, the origin story of this. Uh, I was at PAX East in Boston one year and I was staying at a friend's house and my friend knew that I had a love affair with hexagons. I have, and it's true, I have a like complete obsession with hexagons. I think they're na- the most wonderful polygon ever. Anyway, so he's like, I know this guy in the MIT Media Lab who's making games with these like weird enchanted illuminated hexagons that can think for themselves and display all these strange patterns of interacting light. And I was like, that sounds weird. So we go over there and I meet this guy named Jonathan Bobro, uh, who is about to graduate with his master's from the MIT Media Lab, who had developed these as uh, his master's project. And uh, I just fell immediately in love with them. I had never seen anything like them before. And they also, um, they did things that I, that I've wanted to see, but didn't quite know how they could be done. So right now, as you know, in board games, there are a lot of attempts to integrate technology with board games. Like, so there are often app assistants that will sit to the side of a game on like an iPad or something and, you know, give you instructions or change the state of the game or whatever. Um, And I've, I've liked the idea of merging technology and board games in principle, but I do not like how it's been done so far. I feel like whenever I play those games where I'm looking off to an iPad on the side, it just feels distracting. I want the game components themselves to come alive with intelligence, right? Uh, And that is what Jonathan did. Uh, So these, these little hexagons, you put them together and they talk to one another and they can do all kinds of things that nothing else I've seen can. Um, so they're very, very new. Now, whether they're going to be successful, I don't know. They are so different and so new that it could be a liability because people don't understand what they're doing. Um, but I have some faith that if Jonathan can get them in front of enough people, uh, they will feel the magic. And Jonathan is an elite engineer who's, who has made them feel amazing to play with. I mean, they look incredible. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, they they don't come much smarter than than Jonathan. So uh, they have a yeah, they and have a chance. I mean, from what I've seen, I definitely think if you if you're able to get a footing in, that would be a big deal. Because one of the big things with uh, these technology board game fusions is it's a lot easier to like send an update for a new like DLC equivalent, or if you want to change something, which could really help people just get new games on a quicker basis. So that's always a big attraction. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if I've mentioned it yet, but or if any of us have, but they're called Blinks. Yeah, I don't think we did. Um, (laughs) Yeah, good to bring that up. important. (laughs) Yeah, so if if listeners are interested in them, they can uh, learn about them at move38.com. I am not involved in the project anymore. I'm full-time for North Star Games and have been for about a year now. so, so I, I helped found the company, but a lot of the work that needed to be done was uh, it, it required a, a level of technicality in engineering that I don't have. Uh, so I took myself off the project, but Jonathan is still going strong. They had a Kickstarter campaign earlier this year that raised a lot of money. So uh, I think it's do- I think it's going well. Yeah, I I know that you you were working with North Star Games, then you stopped working with them for a while to concentrate on your own projects. Now you're with them again uh, to work on Oceans. Yeah, I actually stopped in order to found Move Thirty Eight, and uh, I'm glad I did. It was an amazing experience. Right. So do do you do you have a preference between working with the larger company versus working independently and in the future how do you see your path going forward do you think you're happy now with north star again for a long time or are there any other ideas for crazy new companies that you want to start oh yeah well this is this is a question i think about all of the time so 
We could t- we could talk the rest of the show about this. I'll try to be brief. Oh, please. Oh, go ahead. Let's do it. <laughs> so first, I-, I really love working for North Star Games. Um, they have some really great strengths. First, they have just a lot of wonderful, smart people working for them. There's not like petty politics at the company. Uh, everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, the company is like 22 people at it now. Um, and it's just so many lovely people. So it is very pleasant to work there. And uh, I think I share a lot of the strategy ideas that the company was founded on. So I, I feel like, um, I, I don't feel like too often that I'm at odds with what management is trying to do. Like I, I buy in. Um, that said, I also have a very restless mind and uh, I have a lot of uh, ideas uh, for things I would like to do that I've been narrowing down over the course of years. So I have a couple of a couple of big ideas that I would be very excited to try at some point. Um, but I'm not ready. I'm not ready to do it yet because I'm happy at North Star <laughs> now. You're not going to make any big announcements on our show right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. But I- I'll let you know uh, if I ever do it and then I'll, I'll come back on the show. And That'd be great. And uh, as a own small personal preference, I'd love to see if, as you said, you worked in it with uh, neuroscience and, and love to see a game that heavily pulls off that. Maybe something a bit, more people can learn about what happens in the brain. That would definitely be cool as someone who studied that in college too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a difficult subject matter to convey yeah. in a game. I mean, it's yeah. difficult to get, convey in any platform. Uh, yeah, interesting to think about that. I, there was a time uh, I've de- you know taught like uh, I've you know come into like grammar school and middle school classes now and then to try to convey things about uh, brain science. And there was one time when I made a, a human neural network uh, at, with made out of little kids. That was pretty cool. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a game in there. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Uh, you know, you we're talking a little bit about game design and you have published on your website a bunch of essays, sort of blog posts, as well as on Board Game Geek about game design. Yeah. And if people uh, haven't found them, I definitely recommend you check them out. Do you feel that you write those more to help other people or are they more for yourself to kind of work through things in your process? How do you go about thinking those through? Because I find them kind of fascinating. Uh, I think it's a mixture of things. Uh, I mean, I, it always starts because there's, I have a burning desire to say something. Uh, I guess part of it is just I like hearing the sound of my own voice. Um, also, it helps me to work out my own ideas so that I understand them better. You know, you don't really know what you know until you try to communicate it to somebody else. Um, so I often find in the act of writing, I'm like, oh, I revise my thought based on uh, my attempt to communicate it. Uh, so it's a way of learning for me. I think that's a big, big part of it, which means that it's not all, like not all the essays in there are necessarily going to help everybody. In fact, I'd say in the last year or so, I've been writing more and more obscure things I've sort of been using the blog as my outlet to talk about things that don't necessarily have a big audience. Well, even so, if there's that one person looking for that small thing, it could be, be the difference. So just because something obscure doesn't mean it's bad not to put out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I get a lot of my inspiration from obscure things. I want them to exist in the world. Um, yeah, it's you know part of being creative is trying things that aren't necessarily going to be super popular yeah and also in particular with board games because i'm sure jonathan will uh, agree with me how many times we've tried to look up because we found some really weird interaction and mm-hmm. we're like no one's answering talking about it so we're really confused how we should rule on it <laughs> yeah yeah those can come up uh you should go uh maybe the way of uh ignasi from portal who uh, wrote a bunch of uh, s- similar essays on game design and co- later compiled them into a couple of books about game design yeah i you know i've thought about that um I, I think like right now the time we're living in is an amazing time to be studying game design because i mean it's analogous to like the enlightenment and the development of the scientific method right so games were never a thing that like thousands of people did professionally in human history up until the last couple of decades. 
Uh, and now it's happening. And so we're learning so much uh, about how to make games. And we're, we're just learning it all right now. So it's like a magical time. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, as we said earlier, board games, there's more and more coming out all the time now. And because of that, though, also, we're seeing both in, we're also seeing connection between the board games, video games, and the technology combined together. Just all these things are really growing at such a pace to really maybe test out some weird ideas or obscure things and also see how people do react, as we saw, like with something like Legacy, where it is a sort of one time play. How do people react to that kind of stuff? And, Right. The market reacted very well. So we can see like, all right, that it's curious to see. And then even like, I don't know if a board game went off to you, but like, for example, there was that video game that literally challenged people to solve like uh, different genes and people were actually able to uncode some stuff. Like it pretty much made a hive mind. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, I love the idea of the gamification of real life problems, I think is a fascinating subject to me. When you could have several podcast episodes. <laughs> if only the, it can get the funding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, as we we are very close to Gen Con, so I'm sure you're very busy. So we got some final sort of bonus questions. Wait, mommy. We always love to ask everyone. So first, is there a trend in the current tabletop industry that you're either really excited about or worried about? Um, I would say, yeah, I, I, I think I think the... Okay, here's my thesis. This is something that might be more of interest <laughs> to uh, game industry professionals than the audience, I'm not sure. But I think that we've, in the last maybe year or two, r- reached an inflection point where uh, the rate of supply growth is outstripping the rate of demand growth. So the market, market for board games is still growing, but the supply of board games seems to be growing faster than that for the first time. Uh, and so there's uh, a lot of sort of froth. And I, my prediction is that sometime in the next five years, there's going to be uh, a, a culling, a pretty significant culling of board game publishers. Uh, that's a pretty bold prediction, I know. Uh, so come back five years from now and we'll see if I was an idiot or not. Uh, Do you see it as something similar to maybe the App Store when that first launched on iPhone where it was just getting flooded with all these cheap apps, uh, but now it's kind of fallen down a bit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's not a lot of barriers to entry in publishing a board game. So a lot of people can do it, which means like the supply can be very responsive to demand. And that's what has happened the market grew and grew and grew and grew, and people were like, "I gotta make some games." And, and also, like when you design, when you play games a lot, like the next step is often to like think about how to make them better, and then you become a game designer all of a sudden. So a lot of people are doing that. I think it was at PAX Unplugged. Uh, me and Jonathan actually were talking about this because someone mentioned we're probably gonna hit a plateau, and you know, I th- I'm I'm worried we're gonna sort of see, you know, what happened to collectible card games, where. You see, sort of like once people have invested in Magic the Gathering, uh-huh. because it, it sort of owned the market because of that. So it was very hard for other CCGs to enter because people are in. And I'm wondering if that's going to happen, if people are going to be like, well, I already buy a lot of Day games, who owns, you know, like half the board game industry already, that like, why should I invest in this? Or I already have the legendary right. deck building game or the Dominion deck building game. Why should I buy th- this deck building game? So like interesting. So I, I I think there might be a weakness in that analogy between magic and what's happening now. Right. It's not perfect. Like that was that one's a bit more because of the randomness of pack. So it, you, when you go down one money hole. Right. Right. Well, it's also that like once you're committed to magic, it's hard to uncommit. Right. You've spent all this money, so you're like trapped by your own sense of sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> you have a social network because you go to the events and stuff. So like magic is very sticky in a way that like the broader act of playing board games is not. In fact, one of the things that has allowed the board game market to thrive is that board game players are very promiscuous about playing games. Like if you go to board game nights around the country like very often, like it's much more common, at least in my experience, that you're going to be learning rules to a new game than playing an old game. Um, there's like a, this this endless hunger to try something new, and that keeps the board game market growing. No, 
Yeah, that's not that's absolutely true. And also another thing that helps out the board game market too is for Magic, for example, if I want to play it, Jonathan has to get his own cards. But you know, I pick up Evolution. I just need to have the copy. And then Jonathan can buy uh, right. like a, a completely different game, which allows for everyone to have sort of their own collection, right? Usually, which is really nice then too, because then it's like, all right, we're at this person's house for board game night, so these are the games that are available. Yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the things that attracted me to board games in the first place, something that I think is very beautiful, is how much entertainment, uh, how much satisfaction, how much like intellectual nourishment a board game can give you, uh, despite the fact that it doesn't cost very much, you know? So like if I buy a Go set, I can play that for the rest of my life and it can change how I think. And it, you know, cost me 25 bucks. I think that's so cool. You know, there aren't very many things in the world that can do that. Yeah. Uh, it's no, it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, so that, that was a lot of, uh, what we're worried about. I don't know if you touched on, uh, something, a trend that maybe you're excited about or happy about. Mm, oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's one that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is that, okay, so when I came into the uh, sort of when I started paying attention to the board game market as a whole in like the early 2000s, there was this really sharp distinction between uh, party games and strategy games. So like if you were to hang out on BGG back then near its inception, like Everybody was talking about Euro games and nobody was into party games. Party games are, you know, it's just for mass market losers or whatever. Um, and that like has completely changed. Uh, so part of that is because like a, a broader diversity of people have become game hobbyists. And part of it is because what qualifies as a party game has changed as people have designed more and more interesting games that don't quite fit into strategy versus party. I've been thinking about this a lot lately because we're about to publish a game called uh, Most Wanted, which is a, a light right, right. strategy game uh, with made uh, consisting of hand bluffing. You're playing like this old Wild West ne'er-do-well, robbing banks and doing stick-em-ups and stuff. Um, but it even, even though uh, ostensibly it's a strategy game, it feels like a party, right? So uh, I, like the game I most liken it to is King of Tokyo. I think our game does for poker what King of Tokyo does for Yahtzee. Um, and like these kinds of games, which which are light strategy, but still feel like a party, there weren't a lot of those when I entered the sort of uh, industry. And, and now, like oh, there are tons and tons of them. Uh, there's just this great diversity of games. And I love games that like make you laugh. So uh, yeah, I'm excited about that, I think. No, I mean, I completely understand. I can think of just from my experience alone, the few years when I first got in, really saw games hitting a public area. I remember like the few of them were like the obvious ones that most gateway games people say are generally on the part of your side that I think of like Apples to Apples, Cards Against Humanity, even Munchkin. Mm -hmm. And now, and when I see some people who like, that's when they bring the table, I'm like, I can be like, oh, there's still great party games, but like that, like there's a variety now, like there's ones where there's hidden trader now. So you have to think like, mm. oh, how are you going to do that for like Resistance Avalon or one of Jonathan's favorites, uh, Two Rooms in a Boom, where if you even have a literally a party of like, you know, 10 people or something, yeah. all of a sudden everyone's like strategizing, depending on different roles and stuff. Yeah. And we've had a blast with that kind of thing. And it's not just a, oh, who can make someone laugh the most either, which the laughter is still there sometimes yeah. seeing how people react. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really cool mixture between thinking hard and laughing hard. Which, and also, usually I find the ones that focus just on laughter, which m make me feel a little better being sometimes a little bit of a, a anxiety when it comes to social situations. Mm. Like apples to apples is sometimes it's like the funniest things are just the inside jokes, which if you're new, you might not get be in. Yeah. But the strategy ones, you're usually in on it. If you're yeah. playing, you're going to be part of it. You're going to know the joke which makes you feel more part of it. It makes you feel a little better. Whether you, even if you're like, you were behind on the strategy, you're like, oh, I get it now. That's what you meant to do. Oh, that's a really good point. But, I hadn't really thought of that. But yeah, now that you say it, I agree. That is true. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Most Wanted too. We were just talking about that in our, and we mentioned in our Gen Con preview episode, in fact, and uh, how 
there's something about the poker mechanics and in games, and I think it goes back to what we were saying about the Go mechanics as well, where there's something about that classic game element that still works if you can take them and expand upon them in an interesting and new way. It sounds like that's what Most Wanted is kind of doing. Yeah, I think there's an example of something I was talking about earlier, how like we know more about how to design games now than ever before in human history. So we can take new things we've learned about making great games and apply them to older principles and thereby make something like really new and really good. Because you're starting with a good foundation. There's a reason that poker has lasted for so long in our culture. Uh, so yeah, very cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And of course, finally, I'm surprised, honestly, that that question went on for so long. We probably could do a whole podcast on some of the things we talked about there, and I would love to. But is there a game that you're playing now, or when do you think that you th- more people should be playing that maybe is a little bit under the radar? Oh, that's a good question. What have I been playing a lot of lately? Um, that's under the radar. So there is one game, which I think is being republished, or maybe it has already, that I, I've always felt deserves more attention than it's gotten. And I've been playing that a lot lately. And it's uh, Finca. Huh. Have you guys ever heard of Finca? No, I don't think so. No, is that T-H, Think? No, it's, it's uh? F, like frog, F-I-N-C-A. Okay. F-I-N-C-A. Finca is Spanish word for a farm. This is about fruit farms in the uh, Spanish island of Majorca. Uh, so you're basically running a fruit farm there, and there are these adorable fruit meeples of all different kinds, uh, you know, grapes, limes, lemons. There's You can also grow almonds, I think. Uh, and there's a pile of meeples that are really colorful and beautiful for each one. Um, it's just a super well-designed game. It works best with two. I play a lot of games with my wife. Um, so I'm always looking for games that play great with two, and it plays amazing with two. Uh, it used to be Hans im Gluck was the publisher of it, German publisher. I think it was a nominee for the Spiel des Arts when it, whatever year it was published. Um, uh, and I think it's being republished so people can look for it. Speaking of the Spiel des Arts, since I'm here also to plug North Star's stuff, uh, <laughs> we're going to be the North American publisher for the game that just won the Kenner Spiel des Jars, which is the... Uh, That's right. Yeah, uh, it's it's going to be called The Quacks of Quedlinburg in English. It has a complicated German name in Germany, and it's about... Yeah, you can you can hear me butcher it in our in our, our videos. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, we, we've been so excited. It's been at the top of the hotness for the BGG list for the last three days since the... Uh, or four days since the announcement was made. Uh, and uh, we haven't brought it over yet, uh, we wish we had had copies to sell when this announcement happened, but we, uh, you know, we just licensed it. So, um, and for those who don't know, it's a bag building game where you play a charlatan who's making dubious potions to sell, and you're kind of pushing your luck because you want to pull stuff out of your bag to throw into your potion. But if you pull too much of the wrong thing, your potion gets spoiled, and you can't sell it, you can't make money, etc. Uh, so, yeah, super great game, super refined, beautiful components. Uh, I can't wait to uh, bring it over here. That's a pretty big get. Uh, that that must be pretty exciting for you guys uh, to have a game of that level of prestige. Uh, were you in the talks to get the rights to that before it was an award nominee or after? Well, we so me and another guy who works at North Star Games, uh, his name is Luke Warren, we went to Nuremberg this last year with uh, the intent of uh, licensing a game for U.S. publication that had already been published in Europe. And we actually found two games. We licensed one right away. That game was in Europe called uh, Capital. Here it's going to be Warsaw City of Ruins. That we will be selling at Gen Con. Uh, and then we also looked at this other game, which we were calling Quacksalber, which is the first word in the German title of this Quacks game. Uh, but we didn't get to play it at Nuremberg. It just, you know, it's just we were playing a million games and we just, uh, we didn't have the English rules and we didn't have anybody to teach us. So we're like, this looks really interesting, but we can't just license it without playing it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it took us longer to get to the point where we were ready to license it. But thank God we got there because uh, now it's got the Kenner Spiel and it's our first one. Yeah, good pick. Good eye. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, at Gen Con, if maybe people are going to be there, maybe they can stop by, look for you, find your booth. What exactly are you going to have to offer there? Is Ocean's going to be for sale yet? No, Ocean's is not going to be for sale. That's going to go to Kickstarter first. Uh, and it keeps getting pushed back because we're also going to tie it to the release of our Evolution video game. Um, and the Evolution video game, you know, video games have really long development cycles. So it looks like the Evolution video game will be released in February, and therefore we probably will run the Kickstarter for Oceans then as well, so we can cross promote between the two. Um, Oceans will go to Kickstarter. We've done every every one of our Evolution games through Kickstarter, and it's been good to us. Uh, it's also a great way to get feedback uh, as we put the final touches on the game. So yeah, that's how it's going to go. I think. Yeah, well, we'll definitely look forward to that. Uh, For people who maybe can't attend Gen Con or who have already missed it after this has aired, uh, how else can people find you on the web, follow you personally, as well as North Star Games, or any other projects you want to plug right now? Yeah, so uh, a couple other games I want to plug. So like I said, we're doing a lot of stuff for Gen Con. Uh, I've talked about Most Wanted. That's being released at Gen Con. You can buy it there. Booth 2311. Uh, the same goes for Capital, which is also a, a super excellent game. Uh, we also have some more like sort of party games that are coming out. I mentioned three Target exclusives that are about to come out. I want to describe them. Oh, please. Um, so uh, one is the 10th anniversary edition of our game, Say Anything, uh, which is a, a sort of pure party game, but a party game that sort of lets you do, uh, sort of unleashes your creativity in a way that a lot of other party games don't. So the structure is loosely like, for example, something like Cards Against Humanity, except you don't have cards, you have a whiteboard, and you write out uh, any answer that you want to write out. And uh, the way we've designed the game makes it so that that's not an intimidating thing. People end up being more creative and imaginative about it than they expect they will be. Uh, I think that's really the game's strongest point. So we've sold about a million copies of that, and we're doing an exclusive with Target to do a 10th anniversary edition with all new questions. The second thing is we have this game. This is probably the most ridiculous project I've ever worked on, but I'm delighted by it. It's called Dude. It's a game where you say dude. So uh, let's say you're all sitting around a table, uh, and you all have cards in your hand, and each card says dude in a different way. One might have dude in all caps. One might have dude in lowercase. One might have dude with an exclamation point or a question mark. And your job is to read off the card in such a way that other people will be able to know which card you have. So you're, And other people are doing the same thing at the same time. So it's sort of like Happy Salmon in this way, where you're looking for matches. So you got all these people saying dude around the table in all these ridiculous ways and, uh, and, and making matches. Um, I don't know if that at all conveys how charming it is, but it is one of the most ridiculous experiences you can have. So we're doing a game called Dude. It costs, like, think, uh, eleven ninety nine at Target, and it'll be released in two days. Um, and we're also, at the same time, releasing a second game called More Dude, which is another game where you say dude. Uh, and I'm going to leave that as a surprise. Uh, it's really <laughs> cool. Wow. Oh, man. I, I'm just imagining playing the Dude game with... A group of people that everyone's just uh, maybe a little bit intoxicated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I've done it, and it's funny. I, I This is one of those games where uh, it. I, I wish I could talk about it better. There are some games that are just really hard to convey what's what they're like in words, and this is that maybe more than anything I've uh, had to talk about. So if you get a chance, just try it and uh, tell me what you think. It sounds like a very interesting, uh, like almost an exploration of language and how different inflections and tones can convey very different meanings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, not only that, just maybe the evolution of that word, like because of pop culture, because I'm sure to get some of the guesses, some people are going to maybe refer to some uh, famous lines or movies. Right. Oh, yeah. That word has so many shades of meaning. Uh, it's this very sort of generalist word. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm glad you brought up Say Anything as well, because when we were looking over the games of Gen Con, we saw Say Anything or like that 10th anniversary edition. We got to get a copy of that. That game's really fun. It's a great party game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we sold like a million copies of that game in, over the last few years. Uh, so, yeah, it's cool. I also think when we were looking at our list, we saw like, 
an adult version of Say Anything will be demoed. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, we are working on that. Uh, I, I, I haven't been involved in that, so I don't know the details. I'm just, yeah, it's- I'm just terrified because I already know that just having certain people at the table, that that already becomes that. So I know, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even beyond that. So where can people find you? What's your uh, – give us a quick shout out to your website, Twitter handle, et cetera. Yeah, we are North Star Games. Dot com on Twitter, we're North Star Games, and Facebook, we're North Star Games. I, Nick Bentley, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm this is the worst Twitter Twitter handle ever. It's Nick underscore underscore Bentley. <laughs> Why two underscores? Because the so, name with one underscore was taken, and I thought of the first stupid thing that came into my head back uh, in the day. I don't know. I've, I've seen a lot of people do that, and you know, it's probably a good thing. I've given up because the term Will Keeler is probably one just a little bit below. John Smith in terms of <laughs> uniqueness. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, people can find us at Roll for Crit on Twitter, no underscores, <laughs> or uh, rollforcrit.com for more videos and interviews like this, and of definitely a bunch of Gen Con coverage for this year. You're going to want to stay tuned for that. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. I feel like there's so much more that we could discuss. I still want to talk to you about. But yeah, it was a great pleasure. Have me back on again. Oh, we'd love to, especially, I mean, there's so many things that could have been their own, their own podcast. <laughs> yeah. You propose it. I'll do it. Oh, don't tempt us. <laughs> <laughs> we will do it. We'll definitely come back and we're really looking forward to seeing finally the final product of Oceans and hopefully a bunch of other cool stuff at Gen Con this year. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Jonathan. I'm Will. And this has been Roll for Crit Spotlight. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more awesome board game content from Roll for Crit. And please leave a comment. We're lonely. 